Hello, and welcome to Senior Speak New Hampshire on your Concord TV, sponsored by AARP. I am Karen Omer Dorsch, the producer host of this program and a volunteer for AARP New Hampshire. During the pandemic, to try and keep in contact with friends of ours, uh, the New Hampshire AARP volunteers and our staff leader created a virtual book club. And uh, as my viewers know who are members of book clubs, book clubs have a way of opening doors that you haven't expected. And that is exactly what our book club did for me because it introduced me to my two guests that I have with me today. And um, that is Michael Cameron Ward, who is an author of our first read, which was A Colored Man in Exeter. And Michael Provost, who is a friend, whom I later learned was a good friend of his. Michael Provost is also a, an AARP volunteer, and we had occasion to talk about this friendship, which began when they were in kindergarten in um, 1959? Seven. 1957. Seven. In, and I was struck by the fact that in 1957, in this state particularly, which was quite pale in complexion, this friendship between a black person and a white person was birthed. And I was very curious about how did that happen? And so it was, it is with great, great delight that I have invited Michael Provost and Michael Cameron Ward to be my guest on the program today. And I want them to tell you this story, which I think you as I have found to be one of the most inspiring, entertaining, an informative story that I've heard in ages. So gentlemen, take it away and thank you. And would you begin by telling us a little bit about your early years? Early years. I was well, born. Yep. <laughs> we were both born, born hatched. Uh, my grandparents were both dairy farmers uh, and I actually grew up adjacent to one of my grandparents' farms. So. We roamed the woods and fields, and it was a pretty free and normal upbringing. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, I guess I had a normal upbringing <laughs> <laughs> until um, a gang leader moved into our house, moved in next to us in Brooklyn, and he beat the snot out of me and my brother. I was four years old. Mm. I wouldn't hand over my uh, candy that my mom gave me. It was a Saturday morning, and. Um, they took my brother's paper route money. And then about a week after that, we caught a guy looking in the window and one in the afternoon at my seven-year-old sister. So with that, my folks decided we had to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. My dad was in the Navy. He was on a ship. And he couldn't do anything for us. So we had a relative who had attempted to start a bed and breakfast in Lee, New Hampshire. And it failed because it was too far away from Metro New York, New Jersey, yeah, yeah. for regular black folks to drive up. I mean, you're talking 14 hours mm -hmm. on Route 1 in the days of the Green Book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went from 362 Grand Avenue in Brooklyn to a dirt road in Lee, New Hampshire. <laughs> Big Hook Road. And uh, when you shut off the lights at night, it was pitch black. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was it you said you'd like to do? Go off and do what? Roam around? Oh, yeah. We used to roam yeah. around all the time. Did you ever do it at night? Uh, yeah. yeah. We used to go out uh -huh. at night. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of my sisters went out to look at the uh, stars <laughs> one night. She went out down the steps. And all of a sudden, we heard this shriek. And she comes flying in the house, completely distraught. There's a monster out there. There's a monster out there. It's got this giant gleaming eye, and it, I, it touched me. <laughs> so mom turns on the yard light, and if you know anything about cows, it was a Holstein. She ran <laughs> to the black part, and she was a little kid, so there was this eye 
that was reflecting from the light from the house, just sitting there glowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she never lived that one down. Yeah, Mike Howe's story is my grandfather had a dairy farm, and sometimes he would forget to latch mm -hmm. the pasture gate well. Mm -hmm. And so if we were staying at my grandmother's when I was really little, I can remember one night her getting up, get up kids, we got to go get the cows. <laughs> and my grandmother's in her galoshes and her nighty, yep. and we're down on the bridge on 108 in yep. Newmarket chasing the cows home to get them back in the field. Mm -hmm. so, I can see that. Yeah. Cows, had a, they like to roam. Well, yeah. yes, so we they roamed. do. Mm -hmm. I know. But I'm I'd, a farmer's I'd daughter. I'd say the first time we met was probably on the school bus bouncing around the back roads. Yeah, could be. And in kindergarten. Yeah. Okay. And, and what was it like to be in kindergarten? Um, actually, I hated it because I had uh, been with my mother, and I was kind of spoiled. And so I didn't really want to go to school and go away to school. But it was OK once I met the teacher and stuff yeah. like that. But it, it was kind of tough for me going to school in the beginning. Uh -huh. But you know, we just, my mother was very good about you just don't judge people, you accept people, and you're friends with everyone. And if you can't say anything good about someone, don't say anything bad about them. So basically. So how did the two of you connect during that time? Well, there weren't that many kids in the kindergarten class. Uh -huh. And the main thing is, um, kids don't know race. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, they don't. Taught. They don't. And so, oh, it's like, oh. Right. Oh, you know, hey, you're brown. I'm white. OK. Let's go play ball or whatever. I mean, it, the kids don't care. It's the adults that teach them how to, quote, exactly. care. I just thought it was exactly. neat because we had the same name. Yeah, right. And that was the other, that was the other thing. Right. Oh, another kid yeah. named Mike. And I remember that. Uh -huh. um, and there was uh, the other thing, of course, is my hair now, which I have very little. But, um, you know, when you got hair like cotton batting, right? And other people have hair, you know, strands of which relatively are like the size of a garden hose. Yeah. Um, it's like, can I touch your hair? Uh huh. Sure. It's like, wow. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was crew cut days, so we yeah. all kind of looked the same. And yeah. Right. Everybody yeah. was. Everybody had parents who'd been in the war yeah. and stuff. And the so, girls all had braids. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So from this time, uh, when did things start to kind of change, or did they, or? Mm. Well. I think we both ran into some sticky situations, uh, Michael definitely more so than what I did, but growing up in a college town in a school system that was geared to produce and deliver for the college, uh -huh. you know, children of the college people, right. you know, and being a native, you kind of right. were, you know, you were uh -huh. there, but, you know, you weren't important. You know, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and of course, Mike, with the experience we had with our required w reading <laughs> for him became very difficult in yeah. school. Let's talk a little bit about that, Mike. Well, or not. yeah, yeah, I'll talk about it. I mean, this stuff doesn't hurt me now. No. <laughs> that bullet has already gone yeah. through. <laughs> and so there was a book we had to read for um, required reading, you know, first grade, Little Black Sambo. Now, if you read the story in isolation, it's an interesting story mm -hmm. and a smart kid. But when you're the only black kid in the black boy in the entire elementary school, yeah. it takes on a slightly different spin. <laughs> and uh, so the first day, we went out for lunch, recess, and I got into a fight mm -hmm. about little black Sambo. Mm -hmm. And I went to the nurse's office, and they checked me out. And uh, the principal said, hey, hmm, that's strange. And the next day, the other sections of the first grade read it, and I got pounded again. This time, they dragged me off before I really got hurt like the day before. So the principal told everybody in the first grade, if you hit Mike or call him Little Black Sambo, your parents are going to hear about this. Fine. Except he didn't give that message to everybody else in the elementary uh -huh. school. So on Wednesday, they told me to go out, stay on the pavement, because we had the paved part and then the, the jungle or whatever. And um, a pair of fourth graders came over and beat the snot out of me. And so with that, he stripped the book from the curriculum, had it removed from the library, 
called the superintendent and the school board and said, I threw this book out of my school because this happened. And quite frankly, he was upset. And he said, I don't know how they could have let this book into, into my school. He said, you know, yeah. can't they see what this could do? Right. Well, the fact is, I was the first black boy in the school district. Right. So yeah. it's kind of like, oh, is that going to cause him trouble? Nobody had gone through the curriculum because sure. they didn't think there'd be sure. any problem. Sure. You know? sure. And then the problem was, of course, that school behavior is regulated, school bus behavior is not. So the beatings continued for about two weeks. Uh -huh. And then he told the kids that beat me up, he told their parents, well, if your kid can't change their behavior, they can find a new school district. Uh -huh. And the next year, uh, well, and then at the end of the see, second week, no, a week after he took the book out of Oyster River, the superintendent also took it out of the Summersworth School District. Uh -huh. And that was that. Okay, so mm -hmm. move along with, mm -hmm. you know, where you were and how you continued to, because you didn't stay in the same area, did you? I mean, after you, of course, talk a little bit about high school. A little bit about high yeah. school? Drama, you know. High school drama. High school drama was the saving grace. We had a yep. wonderful instructor, mm -hmm. uh, S. Carlton Guptill, who instilled in many students a love of drama, a love uh -huh. of history, and the will to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember asking for extra credit in high school mm -hmm. uh, in an in a algebra class. And when I showed up in a little cubicle with a teacher, the teacher said to me, I don't know why you're here. Because you know, you can just take a D for the class and it's still passing. <laughs> yep. So I mean, that really makes you want to learn. Right. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, there was prejudice against the natives in, uh -huh. in, in the town. Uh -huh. I think. And, yeah. But not as much again as there was against Michael. Uh -huh. But it's actually, the, the thing that makes us different is we were two blue collar kids right. in a school tuned to deliver college ready product. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I was a, my family, my two sisters and brothers, we were lab rats mm -hmm. because this is. Sure. We integrated Oyster River the same yeah. day as they integrated Little Rock. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got a brand new school district with four Negroes sure. that we can start and push through and uh, we'll make sure they succeed. Okay, so in that sense, I got a lift. The only thing was, if I didn't do the work and get the grades, uh -huh. I'd get pushed back into general ed. Right. For most kids of blue collar parentage or whatever, they weren't given the choice. Right, right. Remember when Bert Richmond tried to take, what was it, calculus or trigonometry? Yes. And, well, you're in the general ed program. You can't take that. Uh -huh. His father went in and tuned them up. And to this day, Chuck Allen told me, he's a, a classmate of us, ours, he says, you know, that was incredible because he was possibly the best, best mathematician in the school. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And they were going to deny him because you know, wrong side of the tracks type stuff. Right. And um, the co counselor told me not to bother with college. Prep. Yep. Right. Then and when I was a senior, yep. pulled me aside because they were really concerned about the amount, the percentage of their students going on to college mm -hmm. and said to me, what can I do to get you in a UNH? <laughs> and I remember smiling and I looked at him and I said, it's too late. I've already been accepted. See ya. Yeah. And I kept walking down the right. hall. And, and you know, uh, even in Kansas where I grew up, that was a sort of thing that was mm -hmm. going on in education mm -hmm. at that time. You were sort of programmed according to, if I were a farmer's daughter, mm -hmm. what did that give me mm -hmm. as an opportunity, etc. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hopefully our educational system has learned from those poor experiences. Well, we well yes a, and no. <laughs> but <laughs> continue with your, um, with, with, you know, the no. fact that you weren't always together, no. but you seemed to keep together. How did that yes. happen? I got um, it. Basically, well, we did the drama department in high school, um, and during the summer of our, would have been sophomore. our sophomore or junior year, um, they were looking for something to do in the summer 
with a Catholic student center in Durham and the priest that was there, and we started Durham Youth Summer Theater. Father Lawless. Father a man, Lawless. A man who did not care what religion you were, that he cared that you were a kid. Uh -huh. and, and he that cared you needed that, something to do. And he productive. cared that he could provide kids with a place to go, do something, and not get in trouble. Uh -huh. And one of the, the guy died at 44 in his mm -hmm. church. It's like, what the hell? You know? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And it's like, sad. I'm not Catholic. I don't go to church. But that really, really hit. It's like, right. he's 44. So it was a little bit older than my dad, a little younger than my dad. You know? And so we did shows through high school and things. We both went on to UNH in different fields. Mine was the hospitality industry. <laughs> Michael went, went into theater. <laughs> <laughs> Neither one of us ended up in those fields <laughs> well, after, after many trials and tribulations. And stuff. I'm laughing because my yeah. dad bought a restaurant when yeah. I was 11, and he had me on the grill as yeah. a pro at 13. Mm -hmm. So why anyone, Duffy went to uh, school for hospitality too right. for a while, why these people said, oh, I'm going to hospitality. I'm like, run. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's. When my son decided maybe he'd like to be a chef, I said, do you remember when we had the catering service in the mm -hmm. restaurant? We couldn't go anyplace. We couldn't do mm -hmm. anything. Everybody else was off. We were working. Up at because, five. Because, yeah, da, Dad, I'm going to do something else. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I didn't tell him he couldn't. I said, just uh -huh. remember this. Remember mm -hmm. what it was and, like. And during yeah. this time, were the two of you together? Or, I mean, did you see one another? Well, did you well, connect? We, did, we would see each other at reunions. And, and his dad, I had a store. And his dad would come in on his coffee breaks. Okay. And when he'd have his coffee, I'd say, have you heard from Mike? What's Mike mm -hmm. up to? Things like that. Tell him I said hi. And, and Mike, things. where so, were you at this time? New well, Orleans. Uh, let's see. I was in Cleveland. I was in New Orleans. <laughs> you know, yeah. I went to school in Cleveland for a year. Couldn't afford it. And being a country black, I did not, shall we say, integrate well with the brothers and sisters. <laughs> so I came back home. Because uh -huh. even though the people are weird here, I know them, okay, right? Okay, so yes, then you, you did come yeah. back to New Hampshire at that yeah. time. Yeah. And what year was that about? Oh, that would have been 72. Okay. So I skipped a year between high school and college because I wasn't sure if I could earn a living and do stuff right. with just a high school degree. And I ended up sticking a tank in a gas station at 33 below zero one morning mm -hmm. on my knees in January in a breeze. And I said, I'm not going to be doing this next year. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I went to college. <laughs> and all this time, Mike, you were still in New Hampshire? Oh, I got out of Durham as fast as I could. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I moved four miles down the road to Newmarket. And I've had that discussion with people. They yes. said, well, you didn't move very far. So it was far no. enough. Right. Um, There's a certain group of people that we yeah. went to school with who, as soon as they graduated and they started their lives, they made sure it wasn't in Durham. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I had a chance to buy my parents' house. Uh -huh. and send my kids to Oyster River. And I said, no, mm -hmm. I don't want my kids to be raised as trophies. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And the other thing is, neither of us could afford to move into Lee or Durham now. Uh -huh. right. The yeah. demographic is completely different. Mm -hmm. What really stuns a lot of people that read my books is that everybody was poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, I mean, you had to have a lot of money not to have a garden. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. And every third house when we yep. moved on to Lee Hook had an outhouse. Mm -hmm. And some houses didn't have electricity. Yeah. So coming from that standpoint and looking at these towns now, it's like, holy cow. They have no conception of what it was. Yeah. Right. No, zero. they wouldn't. No. They wouldn't. Yeah. But wow. whenever Michael and I met through our lives, it was always a smile, mm -hmm. a hug, a handshake. How's it going? You know, when I was doing work, economic development work in downtowns, I'd get a message, you know, hey, you keep improving these downtowns and keep at it. Well, see, the thing that you know, stunned me so, because the town in Newmarket had a catastrophic blow. It was at 60 when Sam Smith's shoe moved out. And, and the whole town. Timberland. The whole yeah. town just, oh, boom, collapsed. Yes. I mean, they had four yeah. car dealerships and a movie theater, you know, and... Uh, and that was the second time around. First time, 1929, when mm -hmm. the cotton mills went up. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and I, I said, why in the world is he sticking around? There? Well, he was sticking around because there was a viable business he could run. Right. Mm -hmm. That viable business was a restaurant. Mm 
Yeah. And at that point, I still thought he was crazy because <laughs> I had worked for my dad in his restaurant from 11 to 16. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, well, Michael, you know, would you like to inherit this business? <laughs> no, dad. <laughs> no. And that was about the time when I woke up one morning and I said, I don't want to be 60 years old cracking eggs and flipping hamburgers. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I started going in different directions with a catering service. I sold real estate for mm -hmm. a while. By that point in time, Michael was off in computer land. Yeah, well, you got to do something. And yeah. as a, to be quite frank, yeah. I was living in Newton, New Hampshire, and the town clerk, I was registered in my car, said, oh, you do computers. You must be pretty smart. Oh. And I said, no, I sucked at everything else. <laughs> <laughs> That kind of caught him off guard. I'm sure it did. So um, how, because it seems to me that the two of you have become fairly close in recent years again. Mm -hmm. How did that begin or what happened that sort of developed that? Well, I, I knew that Michael had written the book and I knew his mom and dad. Yep. And uh, unfortunately, I was traveling both times when they had passed. So I wasn't able to be at the funerals, which I would have been at if right. I was there. But I let him know. And then when the book came out, of course, I read the book and things. And um, I found that I was very angry. And there were two types of anger. Mm -hmm. One was that Michael hadn't shared these experiences with us. And most of us had no conception of what he was going through. Right. The second one was anger at the people that were doing this. There was a third one, which was anger at myself for not being aware. Right. So I had to deal with all this. Right. And actually, I heard Michael speak in Lee mm -hmm. um, with some other classmates. And it was just phenomenal. Yeah. It was a great experience. I volunteered to uh, help him at some of his speaking sessions and sell books in the back. And uh, we keep in touch. We text back and forth mm -hmm. and things. So, you know, okay. I'd say... Are we as close friends as one of his close friends that I know he has? No, but we're friends. Yeah. Right. And I hope we always will be. Well, I, I am sure you will be. And Michael, yeah. I do want to ask you to talk a little bit about why you didn't share this. Because that's from your folks. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's understand a few basics. We were on a dirt road. My dad coined the town joke in the mid-60s. Until we got here, Lee, New Hampshire was whiter than the North Pole. <laughs> Except all those snowflakes weren't friendly. Yeah. And some of them, well, when my dad was in the Navy, we'd get these calls that we had 15 minutes to leave the house yeah. because they're coming to burn the son of a bitch down. Okay? That's not what they said, but that's just the only thing I could say in this setting. Mm -hmm. And so we'd turn on the lights and no one would come. And then, my dad finally retired because my mom and dad had a deal. 20 years in the US Navy, get the pension and get out. So he did. And one night he was sitting there and the phone rang and mom answered it. And she started crying and he grabbed the phone and basically threatened the man on the phone mm -hmm. to have his number tracked and come after him. And my mom went off. <laughs> You're working 12 hours a day, six days a week. We didn't even have a gun. We're defenseless. So, my dad, being someone who went straight to the point, went up to the hardware store, got a single shot bolt action 22, I don't know, about 100 rounds of ammunition, and he set up a barrel, and every Saturday morning between 10 and 1, I'd stand up on the road and shoot 20 feet down at a barrel. And the thing is, we live on top of the second highest hill in Lee, New Hampshire. And back then, every scrap of land that you could find was cleared because people were raising hay on it because dairy farming was still big. So all of a sudden, Saturday morning, crack, 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 until I ripped off about 50 rounds, 100 rounds every morning, every Saturday morning between 10 and 1. And finally somebody came up and watched me shoot. And he watched me shoot and gave me some advice. <laughs> and then he went down to the American Legion in Newmarket, New Hampshire, and said, young Wad up on the hook road can shoot like a bastard. And the phone call stopped.
But the flip side was we had a, a breach drill for the inside of the house. My sisters were on this side of the front door by the coffee table. My mom would grab the front door with her left hand. When I had the rifle up, yeah. and she'd open the door, and when he stepped across the threshold, he'd look at my sisters first, and I was to drill him. Yeah. And 22 long rifle hollow points from 10 feet. And if he got up, I was to shoot him again. And I was to keep shooting until he didn't get up. Right. I was nine years old. Yeah. We didn't tell people things like that. So, no, no family in the United States or the world States. should have to grow up that way. No, that is very true. There's where my anger and comes from. I am going to have to cut us short. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like not to, mm -hmm. but it's been absolutely great. I have a couple of questions sure. that I want to mm -hmm. ask you. Uh, people who know that you are my guest today, some of them have asked, What's the best advice you could give people who want to promote inclusion and discourage racial bias? Be accepting. Travel. Learn about other cultures. Right. Learn about other people. Good. Don't judge. OK, well, this is something you do in theater because your mind moves at a million miles an hour, and your, your mouth and everybody else is much, much slower, obviously. So you've got to pause. And you say, well, before I say this to this person I've never met before, if I was him or her yeah. and I heard it, what would I think? Yeah. I mean, you can't just say, <laughs> well, my name's Mike. How are you doing, skinny? You know, I mean, you got to <laughs> yeah. give people a break. You got to give them the ability to engage. You don't engage like this. No. You engage like this. Yeah. So you have to have some level mm -hmm. of um, flex. I agree. And uh, one of the other questions that was asked was, um, what are resources that you have come to uh, that might be helpful? And my provo <laughs> and I both agree that if you really are looking for good resources, these books by Michael Cameron Ward are the very best that you can find. So I would encourage you to seek them out and learn from them because Michael is a raconteur par excellence <laughs> and nobody can compete with him. He is fascinating, he is inspirational, uh, and his life is one that is worth being heard. Um, I want to thank both okay. of you. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure to thank have you, for you having us. on my show. And until the next time, viewers, be good, do good, be one. Sketchesofleecom <laughs>